Okay, well, welcome back to the next of our little colorimetry pair. Um, last time we talked about how the eye sees color and how to um, some some of the problems that might be associated with um, reproducing color. But today we're actually going to talk about the the the, the essential element, the the monitor. The thing we display the colors on and how you calibrate them and uh, phil does a lot of monitor calibration these days so uh, phil tell us a little bit about it yes well it's, it, it, it's very pertinent um uh you know obviously our industry has changed an awful lot we've we've seen the predominant display technology move from being crt based cathode ray tubes huge great 27 kvs of potential difference accelerating electrons down a, a glass bottle to to make phosphors glow um, we've seen that technology really give way entirely, or almost entirely, to, to LCD technology, um, where, where it's a solid state system and, and um, you know, the colour's made an entirely different way to the, to the way a CRT based uh, monitor makes colour. Um, but, but equally, um, if, we, if we're going to have a hope of accurately moving colour from production through post production through to delivery, transmission, um, there need to be standards, and, they, and you need to know that the monitor in your grading room or in your edit suite uh, looks the same as the monitor in the QC suite at the broadcaster or at the uh, you know, Blu-ray delivery facility or wherever you're delivering your material to. You want to know that what you're looking at um, looks the same as the guy who's kind of signing it off because it gets very expensive if, um, if, if things have to go back because you know, they're, they're wrong. That little story that I was going to say, uh, years and years ago at Molly, we had, uh, I knew our monitors were well uh, calibrated. We had a series rejected by a large broadcaster, uh, um, but I think that we had our operation. I took our monitor and our client and the machine it was recorded on to the broadcaster and was able to set the, the, the equipment <laughs> up. In a taxi, yeah. it, was, it was incredibly embarrassing. But I, and it was one of those things where I just thought, I know I'm right, and I'm jolly well going to do it. It was, it was, it was cringe-makingly embarrassing, sitting the whole lot up in the QC suite, and the mon their monitors and our monitors were not the same. So they said, there you are. You know, we'll have to regrade the whole thing and charge you for the pleasure. Until the QC guy said, actually, we should look at it on the suite next door because the, the monitors look a bit nicer in there. Uh, at which point the game was over because clearly they hadn't calibrated all their monitors. We didn't have to have the series regraded. We didn't have to pay anything. The client was happy. And uh, we never had another job rejected by that broadcaster ever again. So it was, you know, it was great. All because we took the care to have them calibrated and did it regularly. That's right, to so a that, standard. That was, and the, the, the standard saved standard, you. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a while ago. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, it's, it's often the case people will say to me, oh, can you, w w will my monitor look good? And I say, well, I don't know if it'll look good or not, you know, in your eyes, but it will look correct. Um, you know, um, so our last podcast was 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 all about the sort of the, me the mechanics of, of human color vision and and how we perceive color and and some of the gotchas, the fact that the that the room is almost as important as the as the monitor yeah. that you're looking at, and and those kind of considerations and and the sort of the huge um, uh, latitude that the eye has in being able to track um, color and light level changes. So. I just wanted to sort of like um, uh, you know, kind of lay down. So, so if somebody comes to me and they say, "Oh, can you set my, my monitor up for television use?" Um, the first thing I do is um, I set the overall peak white level to 80 candelas per meter squared. Um, now, the candela per meter squared is an SI measurement of overall uh, luminous intensity. Now, a lot of people use the foot Lambert. Um, yeah. Which, for my money, is a is a. I mean, it's 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 an. You, you know, you can you can be as accurate with foot lamberts as you can with candelas per meter squared. But the foot lambert is a horrible, sort of, um, uh, you know, child of of SI and imperial units. And it also assumes that your monitor is a point source of light, which clearly monitors aren't. Um, uh, so. Even though you can be, no. you know, you can use them interchangeably. There's a factor of about 2.7 to 1 difference. So foot lamberts are a smaller figure than, than candelas per meter squared. Um, and, you know, any piece of test equipment, you can flip between the two. I think actually, you know, I can hear my old physics teachers, you know, shouting in my ear, units, you know, get the units correct. And, and there's as much 
importance as there is in measuring things properly as there is in getting the value of them correct you know so I, I always use the candela per meter squared because it's a BBC standard and because from an SI point of view in this modern world we live in it's correct um, now I appreciate that old school color people like the foot Lambert um, but but I don't so I'll refer to everything in, in terms of candelas per meter squared okay so yeah my first um, port of call is to put a peak white on the monitor and just to measure what the overall illumination yeah, the, the the overall light level being kicked off that display is and of course to do that you can't do that with your eye your eye doesn't measure uh, numbers you, you're going to be using something like this uh, uh, a color probe and that's the that's the handheld handset that goes with that and that's that that's the uh, the device that suckers onto the monitor and in fact that's a CRT probe this is exactly the same device but set up for LCD monitors and and, and that fits on something like a microphone stand and you you know it, it, it looks at the monitor and that allows you to not only take a very accurate reading of the overall illumination coming off the face of the monitor but it also allows you to measure the color temperature of the monitor so by using the right test signals you can get to a point where your monitor will match the monitor in the QC room um, or you know, in the edit suite down the corridor, or the telecine suite in the company across town, where where maybe the, the the materials come from, and it's all about getting consistency in in monitoring. So, why 80 candelas per meter squared? Um, uh, again, it's an old BBC standard, uh, but it's it's derived in a very sensible fashion because at 80 candelas per meter squared, your eye is becoming overly tired. It's not too bright so as to make those those little rods and cones in the back of your eye, and I'll just stick up that picture of the rods and the cones from our last podcast, um, yeah. to, to, to overly tire them. Because remember, once light gets into your eye, it's electromechanical. It, it, it's a it's a it's a, a chemical electrochemical process um, vision. You, you know, those they're little nerve cells, those rods and cones, and it's it's kind of synapses firing and and um, you, you know sort of neurotransmitter chemicals that that make your eyes work. And so if if they're overexposed to very bright light, they get tired and you lose the ability to discern um, detailed changes in, in very bright parts of the picture. Um, additionally, the technology of your monitor, particularly with CRTs, with cathode ray tube monitors, if you drove them too hard, um, the, the, the monitor itself lost the ability to make any reasonable um, uh, you know, detail um, uh, detail apparent in, in the peak whites of the picture. So for a long time, the BBC said, actually, we'll set up our monitors so the peak white is 80 candelas per meter squared. We know the monitor is well within its linear range, and we know, yep. more importantly, your eye is well within its linear range. So 80 candelas per meter squared was the sensible level. Now, I quite often walk into edit suites, and the monitor is as bright as a domestic television. And I put the probe on it, and it's like 200 candelas per meter squared, or even brighter. And the first thing I do is wind it down there to say, well, I kind of like it that bright. You know, it's kind of punchy, you know. And, um, you know, the question is, well, do you want something that's accurate or do you want something that's nice? You, you can't have both. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, and so once we've got that overall peak white illumination level set correctly, which, again, is something that has to be done with uh, a probe. But having said that, most manufacturers will have set their monitors up correctly at the factory. And it's the case with Sony and JVC that... If you move the contrast knob down to the midpoint where you feel that little detent, that little sort of mm -hmm. bump in the travel of the of the adjuster, or if it's a digital adjustment, you know, round about the zero level, that's normally pretty blinking close. So so that's overall white level. Now the next thing to tackle is overall black level. And this is actually doubly important because because most people grade for the look in the blacks. You yeah. know, the, the modern look of television is to have very crushed blacks, very saturated colours, very crushed blacks. And if you want to have a consistency, knowing that the fantastic arty look you've achieved in your edit suite is going to be the same in the QC suite, again, you've got to pay attention to the blacks. If your monitor is a bit sat up, any grading work you do will be a bit crushed in the blacks. And conversely, if your monitor is sat down, so the blacks are a bit low, any grading work you do will be, everything will be sat up and it will all look a bit more washed out than it should. So the signal that, that helps you with that is the thing I've got up on screen at the moment. It's called Pluge. And mm -hmm. that's, that's an abbreviation, that picture lineup generating equipment. That was a, it was a box in the BBC called the Pluge box, which cut, cut, kicked out this signal. And the important thing about the Pluge box, or the Pluge signal, is these two bars on the left-hand side of the screen. One of them is, is looks a bit blacker than, than the, 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 the field around it, and one of them looks a tiny bit greyer than the field around it. And in fact, that left-hand bar is blacker than black. It's a tiny bit blacker than black. And so obviously, for you to be able to see it on my monitor, um, 
that this image is sat up a tiny bit for you to be able to see that. But if you're calibrating, calibrating a television monitor, you want to set the brightness control of the monitor so that that left-hand bar is invisible and the right-hand bar is only just visible. Then you know the monitor is set up correctly for black response. And that's great because you can do that test just with the pluge and with your eye. And in fact, even if you haven't got pluge on your Avid or your Final Cut, um, you will have uh, uh, Simpty bars and Simpty bars have a little pluge yeah. patch bottom right. So again, you can use that signal to, to do the same thing. Uh, and, and again, tweaking the brightness so that the left-hand bar is is invisible and the right-hand bar is only just visible. So pluge is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it on a waveform, if you look at it on a waveform monitor, you, you can confirm that that little bar is just sat underneath the black. So That's right. It's blacker than uh, you black. You shouldn't be able to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and in fact, when I when I started out first calibrating monitors, um, before you know these kind of um, photometers w were commonly available, um, uh, we used to use a little photographic spot meter, and we'd stand a meter away from the monitor, and we'd point the spot meter at the white patch of the blue signal, and that would give us a measurement of overall illumination, and we'd we'd set the monitor's contrast based on the the white patch of the. Uh, of the pluge signal using our little photographic, you know, look through, aim it at the the patch. So that was a, 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 bit, a bit of history. <laughs> did Did you do that in a dark room? Uh, well, the important thing about setting monitors up is that you do it in the light level that the monitor is going to be used for. So this is something worth trying in an edit suite. Uh, set up a monitor um, so that the pluge is displaying correctly, and then turn the lights on and see if the pluge looks correct, and it won't. Or set, it, set up the pluge correctly with the lights turned on, turn the lights off, and again, the monitor will be wrong. So you have to do this with the, either the curtains open or the curtains closed, the lights on or the lights off, the door open, the door closed, but uh, in a way, the normal working in the normal yes. working conditions, exactly. Now, ideally, for lots of other reasons, if, uh, if you're going to start grading, then... Uh, you know, it should be a dark room uh, with only minimal illumination, ideally behind the monitor that you're looking at. Uh, but, you know, people appreciate that they're working rooms and, you know, not everybody can have perfect colour grading lighting. But but you should pop up pluge, set the brightness of your monitor according to the ambient lighting. And, you know, if you know later on in the day you're going to turn the lights on because the the, the, the director and, 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 and all the production staff are coming in sit on the sofa on the back and have a viewing, you may well be tweaking it a few times in the day. But as I say to people, you know, the most important thing you do doesn't need a probe, just needs your eyes and, 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 and pluge, either off a videotape or stored on the Avid or from the test signal generator in the machine room. That is the most important thing to get your monitor in the ballpark. And uh, you do that and you won't get many problems. So once I've done that, once I've got the peak whites correct and I've got the, the overall black level correct, uh, then it's, it's time to start um, uh, calibrating the colour of the monitor. And I start off with a, uh, a grey patch. Now, what you're ideally looking for is you're looking to get the peak whites of the monitor at 6504 Kelvin as the colour temperature, and you're looking to get blacks at 6504 Kelvin as the colour temperature. Well, that's nonsense because black doesn't have a colour. Um, so, so typically what you do is you, you do your black calibration at about 10% or 15% um, grey. Um, right. You know, so that, you, know, you, you, you hear that in studio galleries all the time, the, the lighting director will say to the engineer, oh, camera two's a bit blue in the blacks. What he means is camera two's a bit blue in all the dark grey areas of the picture. Um, you know, Mr. Raxman, can you make the adjustment to the camera so that it matches the other cameras? Um, but of course, the Raxman needs to know that his monitor is accurate before he can do that. So, so once I've I've got the overall white le white level, the overall black level sorted out, I turn my attention to the to, to, to the to the to the greys. And although this looks like kind of a half tone um, grey, this looks like maybe fifty percent grey. Actually, it's the bezold effect is kicked in again, and actually that's only twenty percent grey. So, so in the case of an LCD monitor. I take my uh, my LCD probe, or in the case of a, uh, a a a CRT monitor, I take my CRT probe, I attach that to the display face, and I make adjustments using the uh, the display on the, the the photometer. And I've got a I've got a screen grab of it, yeah. which uh, you know it's, it's it's a lot more. Uh, it's got the workshop here. Um, so so this is this is the the, the two different displays. This this um, this is a Philips um, PM fifty six thirty nine, which has been the standard for forever. And in fact, um, DK Audio now or DK Technologies as they're called, they now own uh, that model and they oh, sell that. It's exactly the same model as the old Philips was. Um, and in fact, my my CRT head is a, a pro television head. You can see that, which was Philips old um, test signal brand. But my LCD head 
is a, a DK technology head. So they are it's it's the same system, just just acquired by a different manufacturer. So um, let me pop back up our uh, just a, a reminder that our 1931 CIE chromaticity chart, which shows that the, the 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 gamut of human vision. And yeah. um, if I go back to um, my Tektronics uh, understanding color gamut poster, and I'll zoom in on their version of the CIE chart. And I encourage you to uh, email uh, your friendly Tektronics representative and and get all their training posters because they're brilliant. They're so full they of information are. and they do so them, accessible. They yeah, yeah they, they send, I, 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 give, I give these away in our training courses because um, uh, you know Tom and Lee, our, our favourite Tektronics reps, will just kind of give us all this stuff. Um, and so, so let, let me zoom in a tiny bit more on the, the tech version of the, the CIE chart. Uh, you can see um, uh, as I think we showed earlier, or it might have been in the previous podcast, uh, we've got our um, our our, our, our our NTSC and our EBU uh, Rec 709 color space is shown on there, and and they're a subset of human vision. You know, there are, there are huge numbers of green colours that you can see, but you'll never display them on a television screen. Similarly, blue and reds and and such. So our our television screen is very much a subset of what your eyes are capable of, and in a sense, this is why we have such problems sort of maintaining um, you know color accuracy through our workflow because um, uh, y you know we have a very very critical instrument, a very very accurate critical instrument in the human eye. So um, on the left hand side here, this is the display I, t I, I, I prefer to work with, but you can work with just a straight RGB um, display. Um, uh, here we go. Here's the here's the here's a very crude sort of LCD uh, representation of the CIE chart, and basically this little black dot is the measurement that the photometer is taking off the front of the monitor, and uh, it's reckoned that um, the square in the middle, once the dots in the square in the middle, um, that's within a quarter of of a uh, of a delta e of a, of a what, what they used to call a, a gnd at the bbc a just noticeable difference or uh, what most engineers refer to as a nat's whisker um <laughs> you know once once the, uh, the, the 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 black dot is inside the, the, the box in the center that is um uh, so close uh, to the color you're after that you can't tell the difference between that and it just being outside the box so that's that's what you're looking for and it's a very easy instrument to use and by adjusting the um the white gains um, on a Sony monitor or on a JVC monitor, they're referred to as the white levels. Um, uh, you can make the um, the little dot march, you know, wherever you want on the display, but you want it in the middle of the box. And you get a few other readings here. You get the overall lumin lu luminosity reading, which again, you know, you're calibrated for television. You're looking to get that down to 80 candelas per meter squared. And as you get the the CIE X and Y coordinates, because um, uh, that's the display we've got up. As you get those. Uh, close by, but by, by by steering the little box in the little dot into the box by tweaking the red, green, and blue gains of the monitor, uh, you see the color temperature, uh, which you know, you know, on this the screen grab I've got here is 6931 kelvins. You see yeah. that starting to march towards 6500 kelvins, which is our, our reference point. It's the the white we want for television usage, and you know by adjusting your um, contrast on the monitor, you want to get your um, overall luminosity, um, the, the Y uppercase. Y figure down to about 80 candelas per meter squared. Uh, so then you get, so then you know, the white of your monitor is the correct color. And uh, then, so you dump peak white, then you, you pop it back to uh, to 20% grey or 15% grey, uh, and you get that correct again. You know, you you go back and you start um, adjusting the biases this time. Well, they refer to as biases on a Sony monitor. I think on a JVC monitor they refer to as cutoffs. Uh, but that's essentially tweaking the um, the colors in the blacks. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, you you, you want to get the the dot into the centre of the box, uh, and uh, you know then you go back and you check the whites again because sometimes adjusting the blacks affects the whites, mm -hmm. and you adjust the whites, and sometimes that knocks the blacks out. And on old-fashioned Barco monitors or Melford monitors or the kind of monitors <laughs> that we were using in the 80s and the 90s, you might have to go around the loop six times to get something that was kind of almost there. And it was it was kind of always compromises, and the yeah. thing about those monitors is you'd get a couple of them sort of matched as you thought, and you'd look at real pictures of them and you think mm, they're still not quite right. And so you, the last the last bit of your job would be to eye match them, um, which was the real challenge. You know they're different, but how are they different? Okay, that one's a tiny bit redder in the blacks. 
you know, and 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 you'd eye, you'd eye match them to get them correct. And these were in the days where in tape suites you'd have, you know, a preview and a record monitor. Yeah. And so they, you'd hope that they were the same model of monitor because then you had a chance of getting them matched. Uh, but but uh, so that's why you know, as, as as kind of young engineers, we did so much monitor calibration because. Uh, tape suites always had two CRT monitors in them that had to be matched otherwise the client would kick off and, and, and play merry hell about the whole business um, but um, generally speaking nowadays in an Avid suite in a smoke room in a, in a Final Cut Pro room there's only one colour monitor and so you're going for you know the best you can do without worrying about it looking correct next to other monitors uh, occasionally uh, the colourist or the client will say but it looks different on the GUI monitor on the on the on the on the play you know, on the playback window on the Avid, it looks different. And all you can say is, I'm sorry, that's a computer GUI monitor, that's never going to be right. You know, for your decisions about colorimetry and blacks and whites, you've really got to be looking at the, the television monitor and ignore what the Avid interface gives you or the Final Cut Pro interface because they're, yeah. they're, 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 you know, you're lucky if they're even approaching right, they, they never are. So, so now we've got our overall black levels correct. We've got our overall white levels correct in terms of level. We've got the color of, of peak white correct. We've got the color of very deep grays correct. So, you know, we kind of hope that the monitor is linear enough now so that there is no color cast change as, as signals That's ramp right. up from very dark blacks to peak whites. Uh, and we're kind of happy with the monitor. There's still a few couple of other things to do to it, but um, we're kind of happy that the monitor is representing colors accurately because with the red, green, and blues all turned on making peak white, the balance is correct. With the red, green, and blues turned on a little bit making deep grays, the color balance is correct. And we're trusting that the monitor's linearity is correct because truth to tell, if it isn't, there's nothing you can do from the front panel of the monitor. You've probably got to send it back to the workshop and have some serious work done on it. Yeah. Um, or even back to the manufacturer because it was, you know. Um, uh, so, so now we're, we're happy that, uh, that, that, that color rendition of the monitor is correct. So the next thing I would do, and again, it's something that can be done with your eyes, you don't need a probe for it, is I would check the saturation of the monitor. And the way you do that is with good old color bars. And uh, there's always a switch on the front of a pro monitor, which is maybe labeled blue check or, um, mm -hmm. or, or blue mask or, or maybe even or blue you, only. Yeah, blue only. Or maybe you turn off the red and the, red and the, and the green guns. Mm -hmm. um, but when you do that, your color bars change from nice, beautiful um, you know, color bars that we all know and love to something that looks just like some blue stripes. Now, what we're seeing there is we're just seeing the output of the blue path of the of, of the of the system now we know that that all the blue in that left hand bar has come via the white bar when the blue only switch wasn't pressed so that's the blue that's come via the luminance channel in video terms the bar on the right of the picture the blue in that bar has come entirely via the blue color difference channel in video terms and the way color bars are set up they're set up so that when you do this test if the picture is correctly saturated, those bars should all have a similar consistency of blue to them. You shouldn't see, you know, one bar brighter than the other or a range of brightnesses of the blue bars. They should all look exactly the same. And, and when they do, by adjusting the saturation knob or the chroma knob, as it's marked on some monitors, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're adjusting the, the relative difference between the color, the, the color that's applied on top of the monochrome picture and the monochrome picture. You know, yeah. the difference between the Y luminance signal in, in component YUV terms and the two color difference signals, the U and the V. When that balance is correct and, uh, and the monitor's in the blue check mode, the blue only mode, then the, then the, the blue bars will all be of consistent uh, color to each uh, consistent brightness to each other. And when you, when you turn the blue check mode off and you go back to the, the color bars, you know, you'll see a nicely saturated picture. So then you know that your monitor has the correct amount of color saturation to it. So with all those things in mind, you've now got a monitor that is faithfully reproducing overall black level, overall white level, the color of white, the color of black, well, the color of grays, but you're trusting mm. that, 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 it, that it's linear, and the overall um, uh, amount of color applied to a, a color picture. So all those things are correct. You've now got a monitor that you can start doing television work on. You, you know, it's consistent. Um, the, 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 the thing to look out for in, in, in our modern era is the difference between the REC 601 and the REC 709 color spaces. And what I'm just popping up now is, is the, um, the equations that are used to transcode between 
RGB, i.e. Um, the three signals that come out of the back of a camera or a telecine or a computer graphics workstation, anything that makes pictures, and YUV, well, that's that's actually wrong. You shouldn't call it YUV. It's YCBCR. Um, yeah. But, but that kind of intermediate um, component format, which is largely what's recorded on videotape or what's what's gets encoded into MPEG for delivery to the home, all those kind of things. And back again to RGB, which is what's being displayed on your monitor. So we've got this kind of intermediate format, YCRCB, or you know, commonly referred to by engineers slightly wrongly as YUV. Um, uh, but YUV isn't how pictures are acquired and they're not how pictures are, are displayed. So we need, we need a, a consistent mathematical transform to transform YCBCR into RGB and back again. Now, in our standard definition days, very well-known set of equations that, that, that engineers kind of had to memorize when they were doing you know their course at Ravensbourne or at BBC Evesham or whatever and 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 that's how you make y it's uh, uh, well I remember it's being 0.3r but it's actually 0.299r plus 0.587g plus 0.114b and then the two color different signals are derived um, thus now that's their percentages yes indeed that's 30 yeah. percent Ex exactly, Nearly yeah. Sixty percent and, and about eleven percent. Yeah, and, and and that 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 reflects back on uh, if we a a Hughes color wheel. <laughs> Spin that thing, Hugh, and let's see if we get okay. some. Let's see if we get some white. We got some wires and we got a battery. <laughs> <laughs> of course, within within the limitation of, of webcams and uh, and uh, screen recorders. Let's see what with, we can with do. With a following Oops. wind, when you spin that thing fast enough, it should it should appear white. Now look at that, look at that. That's that's consistency of vision and colour mixing all rolled into one. That's just the best bit. Let's just let it slow down. And uh, it really is that, that colour wheel, not another one. There it is. Yes. Yeah. That's the Rec 601. I didn't bother. This it, You can try this at home, children. Uh, get your mummy or daddy to, um, to do you a quick uh, chart using your uh, favourite spreadsheet. I did, a, I did it with Excel. Three numbers. And uh, then charted it. There it is, and uh, Rec 601 or Rec 709, if you wish to uh, go the extra mile. So what I'm trying to, I'm, I'm just, just so, 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 so from that um, uh, equation, and, and and splendidly illustrated on your, on your wheel, where there's hold it, hold it up again, so we can see the relative size chunks of colour. There you go. So, 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 um, you, you know that that that's that's reflective of the fact that um, you know I'll pop up our uh, our. Um, uh, you know, we, we we can see how much more sensitive your eyes have to be to blue because there's not so much of blue, and and blue is yeah. not very is not very not very prevalent in nature. So so let's go back to our equations here. But I mean, what I'm driving at is is that is that the the equations for Rec 709, which is the colorimetry we now use for high definition television, they're marginally different. And if your monitor isn't taking that into account. If you've calibrated your monitor for a standard definition signal, and then you feed a high definition signal into it, um, and the monitor doesn't take account of that 601 stroke 709 color space difference, it will be applying the wrong YUV to RGB transform to the incoming signal. Uh, and so consequently, uh, you'll wind up with a slightly different color cast on the face of your monitor. Now, some monitors do it correctly. Sony monitors do the right thing, and they switch in the appropriate matrix depending on the standard that you're working to. But JVC monitors don't, and so generally speaking, for a JVC monitor, you have to calibrate it for the standard you're working to. So if you know your monitor's being used for high definition, that's what you calibrate it to. Standard definition, you calibrate it to the other standard, uh, and and it just means that in fact, there's one facility I deal with where they just kind of they write down the figures for the two color spaces, and they know that if it's a standard definition job today, that the the that's the, uh, the engineer punches the numbers in and they're good, and that's yeah, that's entirely acceptable. Just as a matter of interest, why why is there a difference? What what was the reason for going to Rec six uh, seven oh nine? At all? I, well, I think the, the, the appreciation was that as we went from standard definition to high definition, we were moving from CRTs to uh, solid state display devices, plasmas and LCDs, which have a slightly different color space um, performance. You know, they perform better in the red direction. Uh, and, um, you know, they were sort of taking advantage of the slightly wider gamut of contemporary displays. Um, you know, it's not that different, but you can see it on pictures. You know, if a monitor is yeah, wrong, yeah. You, you can see it on pictures. Um, and uh, and you know if a grading display was left in that state, you'd know that the grader man would be grading either too red if he'd gone the wrong way or too cyan if he'd gone the other way, 
Um, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's something that you have to pay attention to. Um, so that, 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 that was, that, that's really, you know, all I've got to say about, about setting up monitors. I wanted to say a little bit about LCDs, but I don't know if you had a, well, yeah. if you wanted a yeah. butt in there, Hugh. No, I, I, I just, just to say that um, we often talk about compression, and I always uh, refer to uh, YCRCB as an early stage of compression. It's a lot of compression, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Nothing more. So I've just popped so, up. Go on. Go, no, no. I was going to introduce exactly what you'd already beaten me to, so go right ahead. You don't need me. <laughs> you're, the, you're the sensible the sensible wise head in this, in this uh, game. Um, the... The LCDs, um, which, uh, you know, 10 years ago, uh, nobody took television seriously, thought could become useful as grading displays. The LCDs have now largely replaced CRTs. There's still a few places who, who are hang, hanging on to their old Sony BVM D24s and, and, and D32s. And they still consider that to be kind of the gold standard because for a long time, black performance on LCDs hasn't been as good as CRTs were. Um, but you know CRTs are big, expensive things. You know to replace the tube on a on a on a, a BVMD monitor is more than the price of a of an equivalently performing LCD monitor, and you can't even get hold of them anymore. I think my, my friend Daniel, who's the chief engineer at Envy, told me that he managed to source the last two replacement um, D24 tubes in the whole world. So kind of wow. he's he's still got another year or so's worth of life out of his uh, his um, Sony HD uh, grading displays, but. You know, we're and all they were just 24 inches. They weren't even the big. That's 32s. right. They weren't the 32s. Yeah, which um, I mean, you remember the, the big 32s we put in at, um, at midnight transfer. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Those things are monsters. Um, but um, so LCDs are, are where it's all at now. Uh, you, you know, and you could spend an awful lot of money on a color accurate LCD display. But I mean, the great thing about LCDs is that where where is the color made? The color's made in the backlight, uh, and the backlight can either be. Uh, a, 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 a compact fluorescent, you know, cold cathode um, uh, fluorescent tube backlight, or increasingly nowadays it's an LED backlight. Mm. And, and so I suppose first it's worth just having a quick go over about how LCDs work. LCDs yeah. work using this thing called um, uh, a super pneumatic twist principle. So, so just I've, I've got a, I've got the sort of the sandwich, the LCD sandwich diagram up there. Um, it, it works by having this backlight, which um, is a, a bright white light, which is firstly passed through a polarizing filter. And the polarizing filter um, filters out everything except light that's polarized in one plane. Um, so the, 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 the wave fronts of the light are all now oscillating in the same plane, the same direction. Uh, so, so ignoring all the centerpieces of the sandwich, as it were, the last mm -hmm. thing that the light hits is another polarizer, which is polarized in 90 degrees offset from the first polarizer. So if you just had those two polarizers as they are, with the white light going into them, the first polarizer polarizes the light so it's all in a horizontal direction or a vertical direction. I think it depends on the model of the monitor. The second polarizer is set 90 degrees offset from that so that it stops all of that light. So you'd see nothing, you'd just see a black screen because the polarized light has been polarized in one direction. Ah, look at this. So here's the man with his 3D glasses <coughs> doing a perfect demonstration of how polarizers work. And as, as the polarizers are in phase with each other, you can see an image through them. And as they go out of phase with each other, the, the, the one polarizer stops light in one direction and the other polarizer stops in the other, the other direction and no light gets through. And so this is exactly how an LCD works. And what the LCD does, the, 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 the thin film transistor part of the sandwich in the middle is able to twist those photons of light away from the polarization they're in into the opposite polarization. So in essence, those little sub-pixels, the little thin film transistors, are able to turn on the red sub-pixel, the green sub-pixel, and the blue sub-pixel so that you see red, green, blue, or the mixture of them to give you, you know, if they're all turned on, peak white, and if they're all turned on and off in varying degrees, the whole gamut of colors that that monitor is capable of displaying. And that's the sort of the, the, the pneumatic twist principle where, where, where that little thin film transistor is able to spin those photons away from the polarization that they arrive in into, the, into another polarization. And so basically it, it undoes the, um, the, the cutting off effect of the front polarizer so that you can now see that pixel lit up in all its glory. So that's how LCDs work and it's a fundamentally different technology to the way CRTs work. Now for a long time, even monitors that were sold as television displays had very poor uh, black performance. You, you, you yeah. know, they, they, they just couldn't seemingly sort it out in the blacks. But things have come on an awful lot, and now you, you know you get monitors with with fantastic black performance. Um, and uh, 
you, you know, they've, they've sourced out colorimetry, so the colorimetry is as, as you'd want for television. Of course, um, the LCD system has a completely different sort of spectral performance to a CRT, but you know that they that the manufacturer understands this and he and he weights his R G and B signals so that uh, it approximates to the to the, the response of the human eye and so long as you use a uh, a probe with the same metamerism as the display technology you're working on and if if you don't remember metamerism go back to our our colorimetry number one podcast um, then you can you can do uh, a color calibration in exactly the same way as you would have done on a CRT monitor um, the um, so, so a few other points about LCDs, um, uh, you know, as we've mentioned, the, the backlight, the, the technology is moving from being uh, compact fluorescent to being yeah. LED backlit. Compact fluorescent backlights were fine for the purpose, but they used energy, quite a lot of energy. If you run your hand across the back of a, a, a CF backlit monitor, you can feel the heat. And um, after about 20,000 hours, they start going yellow. So, you know, even if your monitor was turned on constantly for three years, you'd have good color imagery for three years without having to wave a probe at it unless somebody had fiddled about with it, of course. Um, and then you've got six months of the monitor going progressively yellower and yellower, and then the, 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 the fluorescent fails, and you know, it's got to go back to the manufacturer. Um, the, the, um, the famous um, um, uh, mm. monitor that everybody's talking about at the moment is the Dolby monitor, the 42-inch Dolby monitor. And that fundamentally um, uh, differs from sort of standard LCDs in as much as it has an LED back panel that isn't just used to universally illuminate the back of the LCD, but they modulate that LED back panel with um, uh, the video that's being displayed in the TFT part of the panel. So you can have super high dynamic range. So let me just see if I understand this right. Um, there you have the light at the back that's shining through all the rest of it. Instead of just being um, an even glow of white, it is actually a, a low resolution image. Exactly, yeah. If yeah. you like. I, mean, I think, I think. So when we're showing a black area, we just don't switch the lights on. We don't there. switch the backlight on, yeah. Now, of course, the, 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 the backlight is much, much lower resolution than the display panel. I think there's 96 pixels per LED illuminating element on the back panel. And so, of course, that means that around the transitions between sort of very dark blacks and, and, and peak whites, for example, you'd see a kind of fuzzy area where the backlight kind of couldn't decide whether it was one or the other. And so what they do is they feed a correcting signal into the, into the video that's feeding the LCD panel to, to sharpen up the backlight. That's how they get around that. And it works brilliantly. And, and, and so the Dolby monitor is, for example, it's the only monitor that can hit the digital cinema initiative, the, the DCI P3 gamut for digital film. Um, no other LCD monitor can do that, and it's because they have this huge ability to, to, to modulate the dynamic range of the monitor on a an area by area of the screen uh, basis. Very clever, but very expensive as well. I think when they first launched that monitor a year ago, they said uh, the cost is a thousand dollars per inch of display, and so at forty two inches, it's an expensive uh, uh, monitor. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it it is, but it equates to the sort of price that people were paying for uh, a CRT. A HD monitor, and they are gorgeous. I mean, yes. you, you feel really confident grading on that, I would think. Yes, yeah, very but, accurate, uh, very, you can see right into the detail in the blacks, and, you know, if you're delivering for film, it's it's the one to have, otherwise you're into having a projector. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, I've, I've seen a couple of their facilities, lovely. So that's, that's given us a, a really good idea of um, walking into a suite and going about setting your, your working environment up, turning on your lights to your working lights, um, adjusting your monitor so you've got your brightness and uh, your uh, contrast ratio correct, setting up your blacks, and you don't need any special kit for that, just one nice uh, pluge or even uh, just a, a typical piece of colour bars, yeah, which yeah. would be handy. Simpty bars, which are found on Avid and File Cut Pro. You've got, you've got the little plus patch down the bottom bottom right there. That's it. Yep. Um, sort that out. Um, um, if you can't uh, get hold of Phil, get hold of somebody with a... a, a, a colorimetry probe or two yeah, no, and have them uh, come and set your colors up for you. It is worth stressing and, and I think pe pe people forget this that these colorimetry probes although they're expensive gadgets I mean they're you know, kind of six thousand pounds or something silly um, they are just photometers they are just tri-stimulus devices they're not they're not wideband um, uh, spectral radiometers that's the, that's the name of a gadget that can that can measure 
you know, the entire band of, of visible light. They're, they're just photometers. You know, they, they work like your eye. And as a consequence, they have metamerisms that are peculiar to their construction. So that's why you can't use a CRT probe on an LCD monitor. You can't uh. use an LCD probe on a plasma monitor. Um, and, and it's why people who are very, very serious about color um, are wandering around with, with photo research, PR655 spectral radiometers. But as a gadget, that's a 38,000 pound gadget. Uh, you know, it's not the kind of thing that, that you probably have in your facility unless you're the moving pitch company, you know, uh, where, where your kind of colour is your word. Um, you know, that's that's, yeah. the, that's the state of things, really. OK, well, we've got we've had a really good look at, at, at setting things up. I think we, you know, it would be very straightforward to go in and start getting your colours right, at least getting your environment set up. And, and a little look there at, at how the sort of the replacement technology for CRTs works and uh, made us all sort of feel a little bit jealous that we can't all have lovely Dolby's. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, the, the, the other thing that people often show me, just as a kind of a close-off, is is those kind of £150 probes you can buy on Tottenham Court Road for setting up your, you, you know, for print prep work and things like that. I've never had any success with those. You know, I mean, you look at the box and it claims that it can work on a CRT and uh, an LCD, and you think, well, how is that possible? Because this is just a blinking, a little gadget that's got three, um, you know, light-dependent resistors in it that have got colour um, gels on them, and it can't have the same metamerism as both of those display types, you know. Um, so I don't recommend them. You know, I, I, I've, I've never really sort of seen the point of that. You know, it's almost better that you don't have it because it's it kind of it's deceiving. You know, so so I say yeah. you stay away from the Hueys and the and those kind of things. And the other little interesting thing I've got up on screen now. A, uh, a mobile phone picture of a monitor that I came across at a facility a few years ago. Now. It's a Sony LMD series monitor. And it's an LCD with burn-in. How is that possible? Well, so, I mean, it, it, it's kind of hard to see from the image. I think I, I think I managed to catch enough of it. You can see that you can see colour bars burnt in on this monitor. And in fact... Yeah, if, I thought it was just my eyes. If actually, you were there... I can just faintly see. When I was there looking at it, it was a lot more apparent. Um, so, so essentially, the reason why that's happened is... Um, the the, the, the the thin film transistor technology that's used in LCD displays relies on um, this liquid crystal um, uh, fluid, uh, which um, basically, as you apply an electric current to it, it, it does this trick of being able to flip the polarization of the photons as they pass through it. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, if you look at the spec sheets for, L for, for LCD monitors, you'll see outrageous claims like, you know, two milliseconds transition time which is actually impossible. Merck, who are the, in fact, this is a, this is a diagram I nicked off their website. Merck, a German company, who are the worldwide sort of, you know, best manufacturer for LCD fluid, they say that their best quality LCD fluid can be switched black to white or white to black in about 16 milliseconds. You can't do it any quicker, you know, just can't manage it, you know. <laughs> and so, in fact, when you look on those spec sheets of monitors that are claiming two milliseconds um, response time, actually, they'll say gray to gray which is then meaningless, you know. It's either black to white or white to black. Grey to grey, what does that tell you? That doesn't tell you anything. And in fact, the reason why this Sony monitor shows this problem is that Sony were quite early proponents of driving the, um, the liquid crystal a bit faster than you really should. And in fact, those, those thin film transistors, they get tired if you drive them too fast, and they lose the ability to entirely switch back to their black state or their white state. They just get lazy. Uh, and, and that's why monitors that actually try and switch faster than 16 milliseconds, you know a year down the line are going to be suffering burning because you've essentially you've tried to do too much with the, um, with the liquid crystal fluid, which uh, the manufacturer says shouldn't be switched faster than 16 milliseconds. So that's, uh, I thought that was kind of like a little interesting, interesting. sort of round off yeah. there. Yeah. I didn't realise that was even possible. Well, there we are. I think that's um, taken us on a nice little journey. We haven't talked about projection, but then I think we'll leave that for a another time maybe or whatever so we haven't yet worked out our next subject have we i can't remember if we have well i'm, I'm desperately hanging on for my um for my um uh, raspberry pi uh you know one single board um computer <gasps> yes because we, we, we we'd quite like to get to, to get on and start talking about that um and 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 you know home brewing and and, and other rapid yeah, development yeah. systems um but uh, so, so far no no luck with that so uh, i think we've got a few things to look at the the, the, the the interesting thing that i've got coming up is i'm doing some testing for a big cable supplier of some new brands of 3G capable coax. So 
um, that will be a nice opportunity to start talking about um, 3G and, and, and the way that works. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that, that has, has real ap application because 3 gigabit per second, you know, 1080p high definition video um, is a real challenge for coaxial cable. And that's why increasingly we're sending it down fiber. But a lot of people are still using coax and, and, and the rules are quite different to, to, to even just standard 1.5 gigabit uh, 1080i type video. Okay, so that'll be an interesting one. And to any of the people who are watching, if you've uh, got an idea for a topic that we should cover, Indeed. let us have it. Because, um, uh, yeah, now that we're beginning to get some feedback from people, it's actually very exciting for us uh, to, to, to think that there are people out there, not just me and Phil, which is lovely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So um, thank you very much, Hugh. As, uh, a yep. pleasure as ever. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, we, we look forward to next time. Indeed. Cheerio. Jolly good.